Often when people talk about climate change, it's treated as a doomsday scenario that will arrive at some point in the future. Similar to the comet impact in that Don't Look Up movie which recently aired on Netflix. However, when it comes to climate change, it's different. Because global warming and the system that causes it are killing people today. Millions die per year due to its consequences. And this is all at just an increase of 1 degree Celsius. And it's only gonna get a lot worse very quickly if we don't change course. I think it is immensely underestimated how urgent this is and just how much has to happen to stop global warming. The special report released by the IPCC in October 2018, which sparked mass climate protests all over the world, says that if you want to have a chance to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have to cut greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. The 1.5 goal is crucial because if we cross 1.5, the long-term damages are irreversible and we're in a lot more trouble. This is the development of global CO2 emissions over the last centuries. We see a small dip in 2020 due to the pandemic and the various shutdowns. But this will likely go up again, like this. Now, of course we are interested in this because if emissions go up, the greenhouse effect is stronger, which causes more solar radiation to be absorbed by greenhouse gases instead of being reflected by the Earth and the atmosphere. And this is roughly how much CO2 would need to be reduced by 2030 in order to be compatible with the 1.5 goal of the Paris Agreement. And this is how much emissions need to go down by 2050 to reach the so-called net zero goal. Now, just take a moment to digest this. It is impossible to overestimate just how massive this is. We need to overhaul the whole way society organizes itself, the whole structure of production built over multiple centuries on a global scale within just the next couple of years to prevent irreversible and catastrophic changes to the climate. It's not just something you can nuke away like a comet. Now, if you disagree with this, you either disagree with the overwhelming evidence and the current scientific consensus, or you think an increase of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius is no big deal. And in both cases, I don't know what to say to you. And this video will not center around proving to you how a 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius warming will be disastrous to the vast majority of humanity. That research has already been done and continues to be done by the brightest scientists around the world and it's there for you to read it. And note that these are just the changes that need to happen on a global scale. Within high income nations who are largely responsible for total historical emissions, this change needs to happen much faster. Scientists have calculated that they need to reach net zero before 2030, which it doesn't look like that's happening. And these are just the numbers for if we start to drastically reduce emissions right now. The longer we wait, the more drastic these reductions need to be. But don't worry, because sustainable capitalism is coming to our rescue. Sustainable investments by private banks will help us move toward a green economy. And genius innovations to curb CO2 emissions are underway, such as these burp-catching masks for cows, or Elon Musk's Tesla tunnel system, the eco-friendly future of transport, which will solve traffic jams once and for all. Is it boring driving down here with all of this? Oh my, there's a traffic jam. Uh, when it's busy with new people constantly, it's not too bad. Uh, but when it's slow and you're by yourself, it, it kind of gets a little boring sometimes. Corporations are becoming sustainable, or so they say. Everyone has jumped on the solar-powered bandwagon. 
BP, one of the dirtiest corporations worldwide, has a few tips on how you can reduce your carbon footprint. Shell, another fossil fuel giant, wants to know what are you willing to change to help reduce emissions. Walmart, the largest company in the world, leader of corporate responsibility and chief destroyer of unionization efforts, has committed itself to sustainability. Swedish fast fashion giant H&M is becoming conscious. A shame that 96% of their claims have found to be greenwashing. Several corporations are firing workers under the pretext of becoming green, such as German multinational Bosch, who are trying to cut 1,000 jobs in Munich, but in truth just want to relocate to Brazil or the Czech Republic, where they can exploit lower wage levels. But okay. Corporations lie, after all. We all know that. Sustainability as a marketing gag is nothing new. Companies should look after their own interests. How else would the invisible hand of the free market system produce all the magic? It's the governments who should step in here to save us from climate disaster, some say. Trump is finally defeated. Joe Biden is president now, and he has rejoined the Paris Agreement, and now he will show these evil corporations, right? There's this misconception about the Paris Agreement that it's somehow this significant milestone in the fight to combat climate change. When the major governments agreed to come together in Paris in 2015, it spread hope amongst many people. The Eiffel Tower even put the 1.5 lights up. But how does the Paris Agreement work? Each country pledges they will reduce annual emissions by a certain amount. These pledges are called nationally determined contributions. The pledges are supposed to help reach the goal of keeping global warming to under 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. However, if you look closely at those pledges, you notice something strange. They don't actually come close to keeping global warming under 1.5. They don't even keep it under 2. Now, the problem, of course, is that these pledges are just that. Pledges. Countries face no consequences for not keeping them. But more importantly, even if all countries do fulfill their pledges, global emissions will rise anyway. It is estimated that they would be on their way to increase global warming at over 3 or even 4 degrees Celsius by 2100, at best. But how is that possible? There are reasons for this, and unsurprisingly, they have to do with capitalism. Take the United States, the biggest imperialist power in the world today. Joe Biden has presented himself as the climate candidate in contrast to Donald Trump. However, he's not that different considering the main priorities of the US state. The US military is the largest institutional producer of greenhouse gases in the world. It would be the world's 24th largest CO2 emitter if it was a country. But despite all of this, the absurdity has reached such levels that the military has even been framed as a core component to fight climate change. Additional military spending has been justified by making global warming a national security issue. Consider cap and trade schemes, which are supposed to shift incentives in order to facilitate more investments into so called green assets. The financial industry has poured trillions of dollars into green assets, most of which, unsurprisingly, turned out not to be green at all. In theory, carbon cap and trade would stimulate technological innovation, more sustainable ways of doing business, and so on. In practice, however, it has not led to significant carbon emission reductions, if at all. 
The main result of carbon trading has been enormous profits for some corporations and acts as a smokescreen for inaction. What about the transition to renewables? They keep talking about it ad nauseum. But what is actually being done about it? One report tracked about $130 billion of subsidies that went to renewable power generation. Meanwhile, another report found that global fossil fuel subsidies were at $5.9 trillion in 2020, which was 7% of global GDP. At the same time, global military expenditure in 2020 is estimated to have been close to $2 trillion. And this is not even the main problem with the transition to renewables. The main problem will be explained later, and it has to do with capital accumulation. So just stick around, because this is the most important aspect. Why do states seem so incapable to solve the climate issue? Is it because they are incompetent to do so? Is it an issue of ignorance? Is more convincing necessary in the free marketplace of ideas? Is it because most of these leaders are just too old to care about these issues? All of those do play some tiny role, but none of those are really the answer to why nothing of significance is happening, and why global warming is steadily increasing after all of these conferences. The main reason is this. Capitalist states only consider solutions, no matter how ineffective they are, so as to not endanger the functioning of capitalism. This is key because in order for our society to produce sustainably, we have to get rid of the functioning of capitalism. And this is why calls on the government to do something are misguided. And this is also the reason you can't reform away the core mechanisms of capital. Attempting to push governments from below are bound to fail. At best, you get a little bit to appease you, but nothing that will endanger the system as a whole. There is a big misconception intentionally reproduced in our society that the state and the private sector are opposed forces, that businesses do as they wish and governments are a vehicle to keep them in check. But this is a false dichotomy, because the state serves corporations. Companies would be nothing without the state, without state investments in infrastructure, the central banking system, the judicial system, and so on. The right-wing libertarian utopia is little more than a joke. Likewise, governments finance themselves through taxes on profits, the sales tax, and taxes on wage labor. The two are not separate. They are part of the same system. Now, I'm just gonna assume that all of you acknowledge climate change is real. But I argue that there are multiple levels of climate change denial. Saying climate change is not real, or thinking climate change is happening but not human-caused, are only the first two levels. The third, I argue, is saying that it is human-caused, but nothing should be done about it. And four, something should be done, but technology will take care of most of it. A large part of the mainstream seems to be at this stage right now. Of what use is a leader who has acknowledged the reality of climate change, but isn't doing anything significant about it. In fact, in many ways, it's more dangerous to have state leaders claim they want to do something about it, but don't. Because people are fooled into thinking global warming is being taken care of and become complacent. Even if you agree with me that there cannot be a sustainable capitalism, it is useful nonetheless to understand why that is. In order to agitate more effectively around this issue, for instance, and in order to break capitalist PR delusions in other people. Because it's not just right-wingers and neoliberals that believe in green capitalism, but the notion of green capitalism is very prevalent in the climate movement in general. Many if not most influential environmental thinkers in the world's high-income countries still refrain from confronting the question of capitalism directly. Even those who manage to be critical of of capitalism fall short of rejecting it. They'll call for a ban on this or a price increase on that. 
What many do is they criticize capitalism, but they settle for solutions to create a more humane, more green, less greedy form of capitalism, uh, or so they think. Some of the more prominent groups have stated that it's not about capitalism or socialism, that it's about the planet. But this is a mistaken position, because of course it is about the social and economic system. It is the primary factor here. Any talk of sustainability without centering class is mostly useless. Quote, humanity, unquote, is not dying away anytime soon. Capitalists will be mostly fine and likely even profit. It's workers and peasants bearing the brunt of both climate change and the capitalist transition to green capitalism and the over 200 species that go extinct every day. So when the rich talk about humanity or we're in this together, they dilute the question of class. They dilute the class conflict. We're not all in this together equally. A billionaire does not carry the same amount of risk as a poor peasant in Latin America. Consider this. The world's richest 1% cause double the CO2 emissions of the poorest half of the planet. So reformism is dominant in the climate movement, which is unsurprising since any issue under capitalism contains a dominant liberal influence. However, we should also be aware of deliberate and more direct attempts by the ruling class to undermine real change by co-opting the climate movement. Billionaire-funded NGOs claim to want to bring about sustainability, but in truth, mostly what they want is um, massive government schemes to give everyone an electric car and continue endless growth so profits are not endangered. One such example is Bill McKibben. Corporate media likes to show him a lot. The environmental organization he co-founded, 350.org, has received millions in funding from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Rockefeller Family Fund. Listen to what he has to say on how to transition to a supposedly sustainable economy. Quote, The most obvious way out of the climate crisis is a new round of growth a giant burst of economic activity designed to replace our fossil fuel system with something else that will let us go on living, just as we do now, or better, but without the carbon. Even or especially as our economy has tanked, we've seized on the idea of green growth as the path out of all our troubles. Notice the lack of relation to class and the emphasis on economic activity here. A recurrent theme is framing the climate crisis as a business opportunity, selling it to investors. But also for Marxists who already know capitalism needs to end anyway, regardless of climate change, the issue of ecological breakdown adds another element we have to be more knowledgeable about, because it directly influences the decisions of a worker state. But also, there are more and more people worrying about this every day, and rightfully so. And it helps with making the connection between this issue to the mode of production among them. During the time of Marx and Engels, the issue of global warming was not as urgent as it is today. Yet even they have analyzed and foreseen how capitalism breaks away from nature, and how it exploits and destroys it. Among many self-described Marxists and other anti-capitalists, there are still great misconceptions about ecology. Some of them even say that environmental concerns should be subordinated to people's needs, as though those two things are separable, or saying that the concept of degrowth is about population reduction and limiting the quality of life, or some such nonsense. Saying it is somehow Malthusian, even though Malthus himself was essentially a proponent of economic growth. And among many of them, there is a kind of attachment to GDP growth similar to neoclassical economists. And if you ask me, it is quite embarrassing for people who call themselves Marxists to be less critical even of GDP than famous liberal economists such as Joseph Stiglitz or other liberal outlets. 
So this video will help with that. A lot of the content in this video is inspired by the analysis of Jason Hickel's book, Less is More, which I recommend you check out. And of course, the Marxist classics are a must read if you want to have a full grasp on the workings of capitalism. This video is part one on this topic. I will release part two tomorrow or the day after that. It is important for the argument to work that you understand most of these chapters. So I hope you'll keep sticking around for part two and three. You'll see references to these sources in the bottom left corner, and the list of all sources will be provided in a Google document, which I'll link in the description below. If you live in a high-income country in the so-called Global North, you feel the effects of global warming, and they are already devastating. But for people in lower-income nations, in the Southern Hemisphere for instance, it's far more destructive. Jason Hickel portrays the situation in Somaliland. In recent years the country was devastated by frequent droughts which have killed about 70% of the country's livestock and made tens of thousands of families flee their homes. Somaliland's Minister for Environment, Shukri Ismail Bandare, said the following, quote, We used to name the droughts. They would be 10 or 15 years apart. Now it is so frequent that people cannot cope with it. You can touch it in Somaliland, the climate change. It is real. It is here. Mass displacements due to the effects of climate change is an issue on the whole African continent. So you have Europeans who complain about refugees while at the same time not caring about climate change at all. Where are those people meant to go? Remember that this is already happening at 1 degree Celsius. 2 degree Celsius warming will be a massacre. The 2 Celsius degree threshold has only been accepted as a reasonable goal because the imperialist nations, such as the US, who are not as affected by a 2 degree Celsius warming, have much greater power in international negotiations. The Sudanese chief negotiator Lumumba Di Aping of the so-called G77 bloc, which mostly consists of semi-colonial countries, said this after the 2 degrees Celsius goal was announced at the Copenhagen summit in 2009. Quote, We have been asked to sign a suicide pact. The people who contribute the least to global warming are those who suffer the most from it. For instance, the average British person has emitted more carbon dioxide in the first two weeks of this year than a average citizen of any one of several African nations does in the entire year. The average American consumes more meat per year than 30 people from India. The average European uses up nine times more plastic than an African person. If everybody consumed at the level of high income nations, we would need four planets to live sustainably. And of course, if everybody consumed at the level of low income countries, there would be no human caused global warming. Okay, so does that mean that people in imperialist nations should just consume less and feel guilty about consuming that much? Well, partly so, but here comes the crucial thing. It's not the people themselves who are at fault for this primarily. It's the system behind it. After all, consumption is only one side of the story. The mode of production is primary. Hickel makes the following example. Let's say as a European you buy Pringles at the grocery store. The material use involved in it shipping it all the way from a low-income country, storing it, and so on, is much higher than if you'd buy potato chips from your local producer. However, because the world capitalist system is set up such that profit is maximized, you get supply chains which may bring in more profit but are disastrous ecologically. This is not something where you as a consumer have too big a say. 
Imperialism means that cheap materials and products tend to get imported from lower income countries and exporting more sophisticated products and capital to sack in as big of a margin as possible. Today, half of the material the global north consumes comes from the low income nations and the vast majority of the global south comes from the global south. The materials from our smartphones largely come from a semi-colonial country. Our consumption is sustained by the extraction of materials from those places. And this dependency does not run the other way. The consumption of poor workers in Africa is based mostly from the materials in their regions. But those greenhouse gas emission per capita stats within imperialist countries need to be put in context as well. For instance, the Swiss Financial Center produces 20 times more greenhouse gas emissions than the total domestic emissions of Switzerland. But there are many fewer people working in finance compared to the rest of the economy. And of course many many fewer people to sack in the bulk of the money made in the financial sector. The International Energy Agency estimates that individual behavioral changes would contribute only about 4% of the necessary reductions toward the net zero goal by 2050. And again, this is not to say that our individual decisions don't matter. But if your individual decisions boil down to buying bioproducts or turning off the lights when you leave your home, but not engaging in collective political struggles, they don't mean very much. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. And as such, imperialism is not just violent military intervention. It's the constant extraction of extra profits that get appropriated by the imperialist nations. However, that does not mean violence is not part of it. It is essential to maintain this system. As companies expand, they begin to saturate the home market and look abroad for new markets to sell their goods. Capitalist free competition gives way to monopoly capitalism. The imperialist mode of production is the most important thing to grasp in order to understand the climate crisis. For every dollar of so-called foreign aid that flows into low-income nations, many more dollars flow back into the pockets of investors in the city of London, for instance, through illicit financial flows, profit repatriation, and capitalist exploitation in general. Same goes for building solar panels in West or Sub-Saharan Africa and wind turbines in Southern Mexico. The profits generated are appropriated by imperialists, but that doesn't make solar panels or wind turbines bad as such, but it is the disregard for the ecological and social concerns of the local population and putting profits in command. And this is why I try to avoid the word poor nation, because those nations aren't poor at all. It's just the workers and peasants who are poor. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the richest countries on earth in terms of natural resources, with mineral reserves valuation estimated at over 35 trillion dollars, which is much larger than even the US GDP. Yet over 70% of the Congolese live on less than $1.90 per day. Similarly, the word rich nation is deceiving as well. Take imperialist France, which is considered a rich country. But 8.3% of the population, which is over 5 million people, live in poverty. It's not you as a worker who mostly benefits, although there's a large section of workers, the so-called labor aristocracy, who benefits quite heavily from the appropriated surplus value. And that labor aristocracy has significant political influence on the imperialist nation's politics, as Lenin argued. But in the end, workers in general are exploited and the large chunk goes to capitalists in your country, wherever that is. Imperialism is among the most important reasons why looking at current CO2 emission numbers is not enough. Looking at current emission stats is convenient because emissions have gone up very quickly in Asia or Africa, which serves to shift blame away from Europe or the US. 
First of all, much of that emissions increase is due to outsourced production, which has exploded since the 80s along with the so-called neoliberal reform period, when it became much easier to export capital to low-income places to make an extra profit from lower wage levels. For instance, people defending the status quo are quick to point out that net deforestation has been going down in some rich countries. They conveniently leave out the fact that deforestation happens at an increasing rate in many lower income countries, which is mainly due to agricultural production being outsourced to those places. But the biggest issue is that we must look at a country's historical emissions, not annual emission rates. And why is that? This way it becomes clear who really is responsible for total carbon emissions. And these figures are staggering. The United States and the European Union alone have contributed the most to climate breakdown, and that despite representing only a tiny minority of global population. Latin America contributes only 8% and Africa just 3 This goes to show how ridiculous blaming overpopulation in Africa is when Europe has generated 12 times more CO2 emissions than the whole African continent. What these numbers also show is that exploited nations have a long way to go until they reach their fair share of carbon emissions. This is important because everyone is entitled to some industrial development, of course. All the major imperialist powers have come a long way by industrializing on the backs of colonial and semi-colonial nations. Not to mention that development of industry and infrastructure largely happens through corporations of imperialist powers, which then cash in a large chunk of profits. And yet, even if they do try to reduce emissions, they risk being sued by a foreign company because scaling back endangers opportunities for profit. This is such an important fact because you have people dismissing this disparity by just claiming that everyone in the world must reduce emissions, which of course, as mentioned, dilutes class within a nation, but also the contradiction between imperialist and semi-colonial nations. Semi-colonial nations have a long way to go until they reach their fair share of CO2 emissions. They must and should increase emissions. It's the imperialist powers who should radically reduce them. So notice the triple exploitation of the peoples in the exploited nations. First, the rise of capitalism and the according industrialization has been accomplished in great parts through the exploitation of the indigenous peoples slavery, colonial conquest, and so on. And second, you then exploit your superior technology and machinery to maintain that constant extraction of value and keep those nations from developing their own independent industry, leading to an underfunded public health system, and so on. And now third, it is disproportionately those who live in those regions today having to live through the worst consequences of global warming, caused by the imperialists, which of course is vastly exacerbated by the lack of a good public health and education system, deteriorated irrigation systems, uh, the tropical diseases like malaria and Zika, which have become more deadly as warming has increased. So what does that mean for you if you live in the US or in Europe? Does that mean you have to live on a tree after the revolution and only eat fruits you find by yourself? What exactly does degrowth mean and is it reconcilable with capitalism? I will answer this in part 2 in which I will also talk about how GDP is a useless metric and why non-growth capitalism is a myth and why only socialism can be the solution. So, if you've made it this far into the video, thank you for watching and I will see you in part 2 of why green capitalism is a lie.